Hi, everybody. This is E. Paro, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. It is Sunday morning here in the Judean Hills, March 22nd, 2020, the 26th day of Adar, 5780. And I hope wherever you're listening to this, uh, all around the globe, you are well and the people that you care about are well. And that if it turns out that at some point you are going to get sick, there's good health care available. And that somebody is running the show in a way that makes you feel taken care of. And um, I think that that's where a lot of this is maybe spinning out of control a little bit, um, where people aren't so sure. The uncertainty is what is very much eating away at us. In a few minutes, I'm going to play the interview that I did with Dr. Naomi Baum, who's a psychologist and an expert in trauma and resilience buildings. Kind of obvious why I uh, why I interviewed her on Friday. But just a couple of things have happened since Friday that I, I just wanted to share. Um, Shabbat was a very interesting Shabbat, at least here in Israel. On the one hand, most stores, if not all, were closed and public transportation was down. So there was more of a sense of a traditional Shabbat than you would normally have. Um, uh, but not, you know, everyone's like, oh, wow, Messiah is going to be coming because everybody's keeping the Sabbath. Let's chill a little bit. First of all, not everybody kept Shabbat completely. There were still plenty of things that were going on in people's private world. Um, and not only that, but on the other side, you didn't have Torah readings and you didn't have the usual prayer services that we have that for many of us make kind of anchor the Shabbat, especially the Torah readings. So, um, things are not so clear. And I'm sorry to be like a, a wet blanket on all this, but, but I, as I, I think I say this also in the interview with Naomi, it's been two days. I don't even remember what I said anymore. Um, I think we have to chill a little bit on the prophecies and on the apocalyptic notions. We haven't a clue. And for me, at least that's what's becoming clearer and clearer and clearer is we really don't have a clue. And because I have had the experiences, thankfully, in my life where I felt very, very much that Hashem was in control of this world and we were we were doing what we could, but there was a much bigger picture and Hashem was in control. So I can go back to that now and find some reassurance uh, and get away from my maybe day-to-day feeling that actually what I was doing was so incredibly important to everybody. And I think perhaps that's what's important right now is to know that there is a plan, there is a plan, there is a creator, and he, as usual, and as always, is in control. Maybe this is a little message to show us on the negative side that things can change very rapidly, that the ticket that we bought to go somewhere can very easily be canceled. And even the little things that we count on, like I'm having a hard time now realizing that I may be spending Passover Seder alone with my husband without the usual kids and grandchildren around the table, which is such an important event for us. So, you know, the, these things like we, you, we can make our plans and we should make our plans and we need to make our plans, but also that they can change and we have to realize that and we have to internalize that and, and switch it out. Uh, And so maybe, maybe that's kind of the point of all this. I don't know. I don't know what the point of any of it is. I'm just trying to get through every day. So um, having a psychologist on was for you guys, but it was also for me. Um, What happened here on Shabbat, though, that I, I I know happened in my community in Efrat, and I spoke to my daughter who lives in a beautiful community called Eli in the middle of the Shomron, just north of Shiloh is that people did what they could. So I know that in her community, she told me that people were in their homes on their porches, staying far away from each other. And they, even though it was a rainy Shabbat, at one point it stopped raining and someone went and got a Torah scroll from the synagogue, opened it up in the middle of the street, very far away from everybody, but the acoustics worked and people were able to go out on their porch and hear the Torah reading and sing with each other, even though everybody was in their own homes. And um, that that she said that was such a beautiful moment. It turned into instead of being a depressing Shabbat where you don't see your friends and you don't get together and you don't go to synagogue, instead it became a beautiful Shabbat where people made an extra effort. And instead of being angry with God to show, hey, we're going to do what we can 
to still keep the customs and still do what we can. And she said it would ended up being really like a, the most beautiful service. And you just saw the effort that people were making and how the community was brought together because this is something that had to happen with a lot of cooperation, still listening to the authorities, but also doing what they could. And the weather cooperated too. She said that for that 20 minutes or half an hour, it didn't rain. And as soon as they rolled up the Torah scroll, picked up the table and put everything back, the heavens opened up again. So everybody's kind of like working in their own way to make sure that it all comes together. Um, so there were some good things, even with all the the new normal, as we could say. And one other thing that happened just before Shabbat, and you can, I'm sure you can find this on Arut Sheva. I saw it in the Hebrew, but I, and I couldn't get onto the English site for some reason. Uh, my Wi-Fi is acting up. So try and get into the Arut Sheva site, and I'm sure you'll see it there. If not, you can write to me and I'll get you a link, eve at thelandofisrael.com, is that just before Shabbat, um, Israel brought our children home. We had over a thousand backpackers and travelers, usually post-army, the the trip Israelis, for those of you who don't know, after the army, get out and get far and go to South America and go to India and go to all places around the globe um, just to kind of get out of that whole highly disciplined head and enjoy a little bit before they get down to the business of of careers and college and all of that. And so we had, oh, I believe, over a thousand backpackers who were stranded in Peru and they, they had closed down the airport in Lima, nothing going in, nothing going out. And Israel asked for and got permission to send four El Al planes uh, all the way, 16-hour flights uh, from Israel to Lima. And apparently some of the interviews with some of the backpackers is that other there are other backpackers there from other countries as well who looked at the Israelis and said, my country isn't coming to get me and definitely not for free because Israel sent those planes and didn't charge them anything. Um, special permission, the, the uh, steward, the captain and the, and the whole staff of El Al, they were up for over 30 hours straight because they, you know, they had the flight there. I suppose they caught a little bit of sleep on the way there. And then they checked everybody in an orderly way, got them on the plane. And before Shabbat, four planes landed. And um, yeah, we brought our kids home. And there's definitely a sense here in Israel with all the craziness and with all what's going on with the government. And I have to say, let me just interrupt myself for a second, that we are having, at least I am, based on his news uh, you know, appearances, that the prime minister and people do have this under control and that there, is, there isn't a sense of panic like that. Um, on the other hand, it's almost like the captain is standing on the top of the ship, but there's a fire in the engine room because of all this stupidity going on with Formia government. So yes, so we do definitely have a sense, though, that Israel is taking care of its citizens, all of them, irrespective of race, religion, or anything else. All of the citizens are being taken care of, including some of our neighbors who maybe don't deserve it because they don't behave very nicely, to put it that way, that Israel is still helping them. And that, uh, and that wherever Israelis are, anywhere in the world, Israel will do whatever we can to bring them home. And I don't know if other countries are doing that, but there's definitely a sense here that um, this is our country and it cares and it will do whatever it can to make sure that we are all safe. And that is a huge feeling. And I hope that wherever you are around the world, you have that too. I don't know if you do, but I certainly hope that you do because there's that, okay, all right, there's so much that I can't do and so much that's out of my control, but someone is in control. They're not God, far from it. That's the ultimate in knowing what's really going on and moving us around the uh, the playing board, but uh, at least for the day-to-day in terms of our health and all of that. Uh, so we all have some readjusting to do now. Um, I am got next six months, no tourists coming in. I don't know how many tour guides or many people in the tourism business are going to survive what's happening here because a lot of places will not be able to come back and a lot of people are going to have to pivot. And there is a question about how we're going to have any kind of income over the next few months, but we're in a boat with a whole lot of people all around the world. 
and definitely tourism is going to be taking a tremendous hit and for a long time because it's not something that picks itself up. Even if we get an all clear and everybody can go about their daily business, things like tours are planned many months in advance. And so um, we'll see what happens. And I've got to think about where I'm going with all this. And was this just a 10-year block of my life that gave me tremendous joy and satisfaction? Is it something that I can pick up again? Is it something that I should pick up again? Or maybe I should be doing something else. So I think we're all going through that in our own heads and with everything that we do. And um, for some people, this is an opportunity. And that's the way I've always looked at the crisis in my life as got to get through this. Things will change, but it's also an opportunity for growth or to do something else. I don't know if I'm quite there yet. We'll see what happens. Uh, Anyway, so um, just stay well, everyone, wherever you are. Keep the faith. Um, keep two meters away from everybody. I have to say that this is, this is for me now, the hardest thing is not being able to see my children, my grandchildren, or get hugs. I, I need it. Turns out that I needed that more than I thought. I took it for granted when I had it, and now I'm not taking it for granted at all. So I've got to get used to that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm healthy. I'm well. So are the people around me. Thank God. Here in Efrat, we have uh, a bunch of sick people who are all at a porn party together, apparently, and then a teacher at the school got sick. And so slowly, slowly, you could feel maybe the news tightening. But on the other hand, um, most of the people, thank God, are also recovering. So as long as our hospital staff and our healthcare workers stay well and have the proper equipment, then uh, hopefully we'll be able to ride this out. And who knows what it'll be until I get on this mic in a week from now. But I'm wishing you all a Shavuot Tov, a good week. And the month of Nisan is coming up here. We've got Rosh Chodesh. We've got the new month of Nisan that apparently is going to be coming our way in a couple of days. So it's the month of new beginnings. It always has been. And really the beginning of the year. So let's see where this year takes not just Israel, but takes mankind. So take care, everybody. Enjoy the interview with Dr. Naomi Baum and make sure to use her as a resource if you feel that what she says resonates with you. Um, That's what she's all about. I've known her for a long time. Really a magnificent person and a tremendous therapist. So um, take care. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Um, You can go onto my website. Might be doing some virtual tours up there, putting something up. I know I have something from the city of David um, that's going to go up at some point during this week. Okay, so this is ending my little monologue to open up the show. Uh, Stay tuned, though, for part two in the crux of the show, the interview with Dr. Naomi Baum. Enjoy, everyone. Stay well. This week on Israel Uncensored with Josh Haston, an interview with Rabbi Zev Shandavav, who says despite the coronavirus outbreak, the focus shouldn't be on what we can't do, but on what we can. Organizing something, reading something, learning, talking to people on the phone that we may not normally get to. We saw an unbelievable amount of rain this winter with the Kinneret almost full and a time where we're being told to use an inordinate amount of water now to wash our hands. That's Israel Uncensored with Josh Haston on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow and Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. It is Friday afternoon, March 20th, 2020, the 24th day of Adar 5780. And before I get to the interview, for which we are risking our lives, but we'll leave that aside, anything for the podcast, I just want to point out something about the date, the 24th of Adar 5780. And all you, you, my listeners know that I always give the Hebrew date. I think it's super important, but it, it's really important. I, I figured out something today while I was, look, while I was uh, making sure I had the date right. In just a few days, we're going into Rosh Chodesh Nisan. We're going into the first day of Nisan. And as many of you know, because I've talked about it more than once, that is the linchpin for the Jewish calendar. Passover has to be in the spring. And in the olden days, the sages would be walking the land now to see if we were ready for spring and ready for Passover. And if the answer was yes, then we would celebrate 
Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of Nisan next week, and if not, they would stick in another month. So it so happens that on the Jewish calendar that's been fixed for about 1,700 years now, there is no second month of Adar. This year, we're going straight into Nisan, but it is possibly going to snow over Shabbat in Jerusalem and in the hills around Jerusalem, and definitely on the Golan Heights. And I couldn't help but thinking that if the sages were around today, they might be sticking in an extra month this year. And I was thinking this because someone has actually petitioned the chief, the chief rabbinate in Israel to do that this year. And because of Corona to put off Passover for an extra month, because Passover coming up in just two weeks is going to cause a lot of stress to people. Although I would imagine that if it's put off by another month, it's going to cause a lot of stress to the young, the parents of young children who are home right now, just with a longer Passover vacation. But, um, but definitely like it'll end at some point. In the meantime, let's get to our interview, just some food for thought. I'm sitting with Dr. Naomi Baum, who's who's an old friend for a long time. Um, We're both married to physicians, so we've even had on occasion a vacation together, like on the Greek Isles a few years ago when the when their health fund uh, took everybody away. But she is herself a renowned psychologist with expertise in trauma and building resilience. And so it is kind of obvious why I asked uh, Nomi if she would sit down with me for a few minutes today to talk to all of us about what's going on uh, and what we could possibly do to get through this situation. So first of all, Nomi, thank you so much. I'm glad that you cooked earlier for Shabbat so we could sit down. Hi, Eve. Thank you. So yes, I am a uh, trauma psychologist, and um, I'm finding uh, in this last week, which has been, uh, for me, uh, both challenging and quite busy, that much of what we have learned about trauma in the past um, from all of our experiences, whether it be with terrorism, war, or natural disasters worldwide, um, have come into good play uh, during this week. A lot of the knowledge that we've gained over the last 20 years and a lot of the skills that we have developed and practiced ourselves and taught others um, are really the kinds of things that can help us at this time. One of the things that I notice is that this is really a time of uncertainty. I would say, if I could characterize what, what, um, what is the word that I would use to characterize this time? It's uncertainty, unknowing. Nobody knows. Nobody can predict the future. And um, what we need to do is fall back on the things that we do know, and the things that we are certain of, um, to help ground ourselves. So on a very small level, I was finding myself um, having a hard time this week because just at this time of year, right before Passover, about eight years ago, I had broken my ankle while guiding and I was in the very unusual position for somebody like myself who's very active and was always out and about of having to stay home. Um, I had realized that going out on crutches wasn't going to end well because I was going to end up falling. I put myself in a wheelchair and for the most part, I spent six weeks at home. And it was a very interesting time for me um, in learning how to reframe things and to be dependent on others. But at least I knew that it was a limited time. They told me I didn't need surgery. They said six, seven weeks and you should be okay. So what you're saying right now, the uncertainty, because nobody, you know, some of the experts are saying it will be up in a month and other people are saying this could be a year, year and a half. It could be till the end of 2021. And I think more than that, it's not just the uncertainty of not knowing when we'll be able to go back to work, assuming that my profession even exists to, to any degree when I get out there, but it's not knowing what's going to happen in the interim. This is not just like a bad, I don't know, like a meteorite hit the world and we all have to stay inside because everything's dark. There is some kind of germ lurking out there that if you go out, you might get, you might get someone that you love sick. Um, we can't, you and I, we can't visit our grandchildren. We, I have uh, a mother who's not as young as she used to be that I dropped some cake and cookies off at her house yesterday from two meters away. But you know, that's, that's also the uncertainty. Are we even going to live to see the end of this? So you, you yourself, and I think it's important for my listeners to hear this, you're not just a professional, but you yourself has exper- have experienced that kind of uncertainty in your life. And perhaps you can take this opportunity to share that with my listeners. 
Actually, I, um, I got into the field of trauma during the B, during the Second Intifada. That's how I started working in the field of trauma um, and became very interested in helping school-aged children and teachers and all different kinds of uh, adults in child- that were involved with children, um, teaching them about trauma. Because one of the things that we learned and we knew is that kids are most impacted by the adults in their environment. And actually, my efforts this week speak to that. I have been trying to work uh, vicariously uh, through um, addressing the needs of parents and educating them so that they can calm themselves down and then they can calm their kids down. Um, I personally encountered um, what some might call a trauma, Uh, When I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011, which is uh, going on nine years, um, that certainly sends a person into a place of great uncertainty and also um, demands of you to kind of look face to face uh, at your own uh, mortality. Um, And uh, subsequently to... uh, being treated with chemo and uh, surgery and all the rest, I wrote a book about uh, traveling through breast cancer uh, from both a personal perspective and uh, using some of my professional knowledge. It's a book called Life Unexpected, A Trauma Psychologist Journeys Through Breast Cancer. So yes, I have some personal experience in dealing with uncertainty um, and also lots of... um, experience in training people how to become more resilient, how to look into themselves and look to see what helps them during troubled times. And I think that's really key here, understanding what we can do. Yeah, we don't know what the future is going to lead to. Um, we Nobody <laughs> has a magic crystal ball. All we know is where we are here and now, and all we can do, this really brings us very much back to the present, is deal in the present as best as we can. So falling back on our strengths, looking at what we do, what helps us when we're feeling distress, what calms us down, what gives us a sense of meaning, What helps us get through the day? These are all the things that we have to think about and do those things. So one of the things that gives people a sense of meaning, and I'll speak here at least to our life here in Israel, is the community, is actually getting together with other people. Not just Passover Seder, which happens once a year, but going to synagogue. I know for my husband, that is a ritual. He gets up every morning. That's part of the structure of his life. And he goes and participates in a minyan. He goes and, you know, and, and is in the morning services in synagogue. And if he can make it after work, in the evening ones as well. That is all being taken away. For some of us, it's seeing our children. It's seeing our grandchildren. It's having them for Shabbat. All the things that we're being told right now that we can't do. Do you think there's a danger here of people falling into unhealthy behaviors because that's how they cope? For example, if someone has had a problem with alcohol or with drugs or anger issues, all of these things that are protected, or we think they're protective, but basically they're just sealing us off from dealing with the emotions. Is there a concern here that some people might be getting into some unhealthy behaviors in, a, in an effort to not deal really with the situation? Uh, certainly the there there's definitely a risk of falling back into unhealthy behaviors and that uh, and we have to be aware of that ourselves and be aware of that in our children and be aware of that uh in the loved ones around us um but rather on than focus on what may go wrong and believe me there are plenty of things that may go wrong i think what we need to do is focus on what we can do right and you had you mentioned a word there um, schedule, daily schedule. So all of us have had our daily schedules totally turned upside down. Uh, you're not guiding. I'm not teaching. Uh, meetings are canceled. Appointments are canceled. Um, as you said, the daily, daily services in synagogue are canceled. Uh, and for kids, of course, school is canceled. So, um, This throws everybody into a tizzy, and one of the things that we can do is try to organize for ourselves, in our own mind, a schedule, some kind of routine, some kind of uh, mm, 
some kind of order of things that we do daily. Now, everybody's different. Some people really like to have, like to know what they're doing at seven o'clock in the morning and at eight o'clock and at 10 o'clock. And other people like to keep things looser. And, and I certainly wouldn't be the one to tell you all of a sudden, now you need to do, now you need to have a rigid schedule. Absolutely not. But you might have certain activities that you want to make sure that you do every day. For example, physical activity. Many of us exercise. The gyms are closed now. The swimming pools are closed. What are we going to do? We have to find alternatives. And there are alternatives. So experts are saying that we can go out and take a walk every day for 10 or 15 minutes, walk someplace where you're not going to meet people, where you're not going to breathe on people. Uh, That's uh, yesterday. I took my dad, my 94-year-old father, out for a walk. We didn't hold hands. We didn't hug. We didn't kiss. But yes, I took him out for a walk because I think it is so important for him to keep moving. He's used to swimming every day and there's no pool now. Um, So physical, uh, so walking is a great activity. Uh, Dancing, put on the music and dance. There's nothing like shaking your whole body to really move the energy and uh, feel much better after a good 20 minute or half hour dance session. Do it with your kids, do it with your spouse, do it with anybody around you, do it by yourself. Uh, It's a wonderful way to shake things up and get things moving. Think about all the other things that you can do in terms of physical activity. There's tons of stuff on YouTube and on the internet, yoga, qigong, anything you could imagine. The, commit to it. Find something to do and do it every single day. So that's one thing that I would say is very important, physical activity. Um, the other the other physical piece of things are getting enough sleep, of course, and eating healthfully. What we tend to do is kind of also go down that slippery slope of saying, oh my God, who, care? who knows what's going to be? I might as well just eat everything that tastes good in the world, chocolate and cake and all the rest. And For many of us, me included, certainly, that is one way that I comfort myself. But I think we need to be aware that uh, we can do that moderately, but not to try to go too overboard and try to keep a routine of meals um, and uh, healthful eating. Uh, Sleeping as well. Bedtime, pretty regular bedtime, going to sleep when you normally go to sleep, waking up when you normally wake up. Maybe getting an extra nap if you have that luxury or if it suits you or if it's good for you, well, fine. Uh, But don't spend all your day sleeping and um, try to keep, again, a certain amount of routine. I think that routine is what grounds us. So how about on the religious side? I know many of my listeners are spiritual people, are believing people. I'm not... um, as community oriented, let's say, as my husband is, I, I don't pray. I don't need to pray with a group. Most women don't. Um, I find when I need to go online with God, it's wherever it is or certain songs that I listen to that do that for me. What do you recommend though, for people for whom, because a lot of what's going on right now are people are praying. They're praying that everyone gets well, stays well. Um, a lot of people have gone a little bit further and are trying to predict Messiah must be coming because in this book of Isaiah, it says this, and in this book, it says that. I suppose if that makes someone feel better, that's fine. That's not my particular. I'm very, very frightened of prophecy and of trying to figure out what's happening in the future. It hasn't gone all too well in our past. So I, I try and stay away from even so-called obvious signs that look like we're heading for this or for that, um, because apocalypse is also a word that you keep hearing uh, around. So what do you suggest for people when it comes to their spiritual side? I would imagine some people might be having crises of faith right now. What's going on? Suddenly I'm worried about things I wasn't worried about. So now we can't one of the things that's going around this week is that for the first time in the 71 years of Israel's existence, all the stores are closed. So in a way, that's good, right? Shabbat is being kept. There's no public transportation. On the other hand, most people usually go to synagogue to hear Torah reading, and it, these are big, important portions that are coming up in the pre-Passover days, are not going to hear that either. And for very many people, that's very grounding every single week to hear the Torah. So do you, what do you, do you see some kind of substitute, you know, doing a, an online prayer service might be working for some people, but are you seeing that people can maybe, can we find some resilience or some 
God within ourselves right now. Perhaps this is an opportunity for people to center themselves in a different way when it comes to our relationship with the Creator. Well, <laughs> when you talk, I have all sorts of uh, associations that come to mind. So I'm trying to keep them in, a, in, in order in my mind. And the first word I want to relate to is grounding. And then the second word I want to relate to is spirituality. So when we talk about grounding and we talked about setting a routine, that's one way to ground. Another very important way to ground ourselves, and I promise you I will get to spirituality too. I will answer your question in a couple of minutes. But another really good way to ground ourselves is simply breathing. And what I'd like to do with you and with our listeners is spend exactly 60 seconds breathing together, oh, maybe 90 seconds. And um, I know may, may, there may be some longtime meditators out there in the audience, and there may be others of you who have shied away or never really cotton to the idea of of meditating. And what I want to do with you now is really just breathe. I want to try to demystify this and just breathe with you. And what that breathing entails is putting both feet on the floor. Let's do that now together. Very good, Eve. <laughs> Put both feet on the floor. Put your hands in your lap. And if you're able to close your eyes, so close your eyes and um, and if you're not, so then find a dot or a spot on the floor and just gaze at that. And what we're going to do is we're going to breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth. And I'm going to count. I'm going to count um, to the count of four on the in-breath. Then we're going to pause for a moment. And then we're going to count to five on the out-breath. So let's do a few breaths like that. Breathing in through our nose. Two three, four, pause, and then breathing out through your mouth, slowly, slowly, two, three, four, five. And again, take another breath, and we're going to breathe in through our nose, two, three, four, hold it for a moment, and breathe out, two, three, four, five. And what I'd like you to do now is continue breathing. Take two more breaths on your own at your own pace, breathing in through your nose. Hold for a moment and out through your mouth. And if you like to count, continue counting. And if you prefer, you can use words, any two pairs of words like in for the in-breath and out for the out-breath. Breathing in and out. And let's take one final breath. And before you open your eyes, just take a quick scan of your body and notice where you're feeling comfortable and where you're feeling tight. And then go back again to the place where you're feeling comfortable. And when you're ready, just open your eyes. So, Eve, how do you feel after having taken four or five breaths? Well, that wasn't so easy for me. Um, I have an Apple Watch, which, which I wear when I go swimming and have my normal days, which every once in a while beeps and tells me, breathe now for two minutes. So, and I usually ignore it. Um, but <laughs> look at, I'm always like, no, I'm too busy later on. But I feel more relaxed. I really, really do. What, what happened to, what's happening if, if anyone did this with me? What happened physiologically here? So presumably what happened is that your heart rate slowed a little bit. Uh, you oxygenated your blood a little bit. You got a little bit more oxygen going into your brain. Just, Just a general sense of relaxation and awareness. And I would say a grounding, it's sort of coming back to yourself, who you are, what you are, shutting out all the noise from around us. There's so much noise. Even though we're home and our house might be quiet, we're being bombarded by WhatsApps and emails and phone calls and the news on the radio or the television or the mm -hmm. internet. And it's a lot of noise, a lot of people talking at us. And here we are just sitting quietly and just kind of coming back to ourselves. And I think this really relates um, this is good for everybody. 
somebody who's looking for a spiritual outlet and somebody who's not particularly spiritual. It can go any which way you want. This is really the one, if you're going to take one thing out of this conversation today, one tool, one idea, this is the idea that I would take. Stop several times during the day and breathe to collect yourself. But getting back to your second question about spirituality and what spiritual resources we have, people, as we know, are very different in their approaches to uh, both organized religion and uh, open spirituality, let's say, connection with God or with the supreme being or whatever you want to call it. Um, And this is certainly another resource in our coping repertoire, reaching out to God, reaching out to a supreme being, knowing that we are all sitting in the hands of God can be a very comforting and affirming feeling for some people. It may not work for everybody, and I certainly don't presume that it does, but breathing again is a way to reconnect to ourselves, and by reconnecting to ourselves, we also reconnect to our spiritual connection. So each person, I think, needs to find within that spiritual realm what works for them, what is good. Some people are very cognitive and spend their time, certainly in the Jewish community, spend their time learning holy texts, whether it be Talmud or Mishnah, or that's um, the the oral tradition or the written tradition, the Bible. Um, certainly Christians read their Bible every day, many, many religious Christians. And that that's great. That's wonderful. That really works for a lot of people, but it may not work for you. If it doesn't work for you, try to think about what, might you try and um, what whether it be writing a letter to God or uh, meditating on a poem or listening to a song um, what what do you think would be uh, helpful to you and affirming to you and the idea is to find something that that gives you comfort and gives you a feeling of support uh, and a feeling of faith for me I know what works for me is really that image of sitting in the hands of God. Um, And that's an image that I used a lot, actually, when I was healing from cancer. I did a lot of guided imagery. Um, Guided imagery is basically using the uh, natural tendencies we have to imagine things. We all imagine, even now, we're imagining, some of us are imagining the end of days and apocalypse. Others of us are imagining that we're going to be finished with this in a week or two. And we're all using our imagination and we can use that imagination really to help ourselves calm down. We don't always have to take it to negative places. So we can use the, our imagination and, and picture calming pictures. We can picture ourselves in a place that we like to be. Maybe it's someplace we, we visited in the past. Maybe it's, maybe it's a cottage on a lake or uh, some beautiful place that we went to or, Uh, Maybe it's someplace we haven't been to and we just imagined, but you picture yourself in that place and remember or bring up to mind, what does the place look like? What does it smell like? What sounds do you hear? And just kind of fully immerse yourself into that place. And you will see that that is also very calming and very strengthening. Um, There's an exercise called Safe Place um, that... um, is a, is a very popular exercise. I think I have it recorded on YouTube. I need to check. Um, but uh, if not, maybe I will record it and put it on YouTube. Um, but that is something that can be very helpful. And, and for myself, as I said, the image that I used, the imagery that was helpful to me was picturing myself in, in God's, in the palm of God's hand. And for me, that was very affirming and comforting. So my place that I go to when I want to feel real peace is something you'll definitely relate to because I know that you and Mike have done this for years, scuba diving, all right, which is where, A, I just love to swim in general, and that's what's been very hard for me in the last couple weeks is not being able to swim, and that's how I literally immerse myself and cut off all the noise, as you said before. But the times that I've gone scuba diving where I really felt God's presence all around me, it's so quiet, and all you hear is your own breathing. 
And of course, in the in Hebrew, which is such a beautiful, meaningful language, nishama, our soul, is the same word as nishima, which is breathing, your breath. And so that's really, that's, I think, where I'm going to be going, at least in my head. Um, but th- this idea of, of helplessness, I think, is what a lot of people are frightened of now. I think we're realizing that Humanity is not as smart as we thought we were. We thought we'd conquered it all. We can get from place to place and we can do this and we can do that. And all of a sudden, the entire world, oddly enough, is together in this same boat of uncertainty. And travel is incredibly restricted, if not completely limited to certain people. So all of that freedom that so many of us, at least in the West, take for granted has been the rug has been pulled out from under us. And we can't get to places and we can't get to people even going to the grocery store is becoming like a really big anxiety-filled deal. And I think that's a lot of that is that, that needing to go. For example, connecting to Tanakh, which is what you spoke about. For me, connecting to it is a physical connection. I take people to places where events happened, and I stand with the Tanakh there open and do that. And I can't do that now. I can't get to those places, and the people aren't here and that, for me, is something that I'm going to have to readjust. And maybe I'll start learning Daf Yomi or, or be able to connect in another way. But that is something I realized also, that for me, Tanakh is a very living, physical thing, not just an intellectual exercise. And I'm going to have to flip that. But among the things that you have done over the years is, I remember you going to Thailand. Where, where did you went? Somewhere where there was, oh, you went to Nepal. There was a tsunami? An earthquake. Okay, so I almost got it right. Not tsunami in Thailand, but an earthquake in Nepal. Do you find, so you, you've really had experience in dealing with other cultures. And this is a very different culture, I would imagine, than the West. Do you find that different cultures have different coping skills as well? Okay, so um, yes, um, certainly um, the way people cope is culture-specific. However, there are themes that run through no matter what culture you're in um, so that the particulars might be different, but I think the generalities are the same. Uh, We know that it's very important to connect to your body and to breathe. And by the way, the two words that I use when I breathe in and out are nishima and nishama. Those are two very nice words to use when you breathe. Um, nishima meaning breath and nishama meaning soul. Uh, but um, so we know that um, the mind body connection is a very important connection. Um, how people play that out can be very different. When we were in Nepal uh, doing work after the earthquake, so meditating is like second nature to them. You cannot believe how easily they just went into it. And it's not like these are people doing yoga every single day, but yoga and meditation is part of their tradition. They know it. They know it from the inside. They know it genetically. I can't explain it. But when I would offer them the opportunity to sit and breathe, they could do it for a half hour easily, just easily. And they said, oh, this was so wonderful. So again, where you, what you do with your body may be different from culture to culture, but acknowledging that stress impacts our bodies, we need to be aware of that. We need to learn how we can calm ourselves down and what works for us. So for one person, it might be taking a run or walking, and for another, it might be sitting and meditating. There are differences, of course, we've been talking about differences within a culture, but between cultures, there are differences as well. Emotions are universal. Uh, Whether you live in Nepal or Israel or Haiti or the United States, fear is fear is fear. We have a different word for it in each culture, and we may express it differently, but fear is the same. And understanding that one of the major emotions that people are experiencing now is fear, um, I think is very important. I wrote a small book um, just last week, actually, I rewrote a book that I had written about dealing with fear of cancer, uh, and changed it, uh, in line with what we're going through now. And it's called free yourself from fear coping with coronavirus. It's available for free as a PDF download on my website, which is www.naomibomb.com. Naomi Baum is spelled N A 
O M I B A U M dot com. And I welcome you to come into my website. It's on the very first page. Download the um, PDF. Have a look at it. See if it's helpful to you. But I think that fear is such a dominant emotion. And one of the things we know about resilience is it's important to find a place where you can share your emotions. You can talk about them. You don't have to squash them down and feel miserable about them. Nobody can take your fear away, but somehow sharing your fear with other people makes it a little bit less fearful, seeing that you're not alone and that other people are experiencing similar things to you reduces maybe the shame, the embarrassment, the guilt, whatever it is that's connected to feeling strong feelings like fear. So um, back to your question about different cultures, um, I think there are universals, and we also have to be attuned to the music of the particular culture. It's a dance when you go into a new culture. You can't assume that what you know is going to work. But what we found is that there are a lot of things that do work cross-culturally. I would imagine also that feeling a sense of reliance on some kind of authority figures would lower the fear. Like here in Israel, I'm feeling that at least the health you know, and both of our husbands are physicians, that they're doing everything they can. And really here I have to throw out a huge thank you from all of us around the world to everybody who's in any way involved with healthcare, not just the physicians and the nurses, but the, the ambulance drivers, the secretaries in the office, the pharmacists, absolutely anybody who's involved with keeping us well is taking a risk at getting sick. And I think we all need to appreciate that those really right now are the guys, are the people on the front line. What's happened here in Israel may be unusual because we have a very strong army that also it can be involved at a moment's notice in civilian life. And so what's interesting happening in Israel, especially given the fact that our Knesset, our, our elected officials are not really doing what they're supposed to be doing, and there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in Israel on the political side, which I really don't want to get into, is you have the health ministry working very much in tandem with now the defense ministry. And certain things are being put into place. For example, masks were brought in by the defense ministry. The defense minister, Naftali Bennett, is the one who organized it. A couple of hotels, which are empty from tourists, now be used as kind of adjunct hospitals for people who are need to be sequestered from others but don't need tremendous medical care. So they need something between the hospital and the home. And so there's a very interesting thing happening here in Israel, which is involving us having trust in the system to not take advantage of that. Because a lot of what we've been hearing is that certain countries that have, let's say, and I don't know what the news coming out of China is real or not, and we may never know, for, but let's say South Korea are countries that are able to really clamp down on other people very quickly in a way that most Western countries cannot do or chose not to do, are coming out of this faster. You know, so most of us think that we want to live in the Western world with a lot of freedoms and a lot of choices, but that also means that there's less discipline among the population in a situation like this, where perhaps you need more discipline, which we see here in Israel because we have had crises, we've had wars, we've had situations where everyone, you couldn't have an argument. Everyone needed to listen to this now because the country was depending on it for one reason or the other. So I'm finding, I don't know if this is unique to Israel, what's happening here and is enabling the authorities perhaps to, as they're talking about, flatten the curve and keep the health um, facilities from being overwhelmed, which is happening in certain countries. Like my listeners know, my son just got out of Italy last week, which is completely collapsed, like on every level, in a very frightening way, and not a country that one would think is a poor country that's going to collapse. This is the kind of thing you expected to hear from, I don't know, Zimbabwe, not from Italy, which is also incidentally showing to me that the EU is not what it was cracked up to be because they've been asking for help from other countries and haven't gotten it which is this may very much change the dynamics between relationships between countries. What's the EU for? To have open borders. If when you need the other countries, they're not coming to help. So I think this might shift the landscape around the world in terms of who you can rely on and who you can't. And, uh, and that these ultimately will be important. Of course, in the middle of the chaos, we're not going to deal with it. But we, as we spoke about before we got online, there are a lot of doctorates out there waiting to be written and a lot of different 
kashlachot. I just forgot the word in English. Implications. Implications that in you know that are going to come out of this. Some of it, most of which I hope will make the world a better place, but it will definitely make the world a different place. Um, one of my sons has was very busy this week because he sells games. And he was going all over the country because the parents were desperate to keep the kids busy and were buying up his stock like crazy. He had one of the busiest weeks ever, except in Steyrot. He went down, where that's one of his clients, is, is in Steyrot and around Gaza. And there was business as usual. Nobody was treating this like a crisis. And he called me and he said, Ima, I realize that this is how they live all the time. They always have things ready in the house for the kids to do because you might suddenly have a wave of missiles coming from Gaza and you not can't leave your house for a week. So it was a very interesting insight that even within Israel, in crisis-ready Israel, there's certain places that are more like always on crisis mode. You work with do you work with people and with, with the kids specifically in that area of Israel? I have I have worked um, uh, in the south certainly, um, and currently I consult for the Amit network of schools, and they are in charge of all of the schools of. Uh, stay road. They're all connected. So I have some contact with them. And I think what you say is absolutely true, that um, this is a population that knows trauma so well from the inside uh, long term. It's not a single event trauma. And what we're experiencing now is also not a single event trauma. Uh, I don't know if I would even characterize it and we could argue back and forth whether it's trauma or not. Certainly it's high stress. Uh, and long-term high stress is exactly what they know in Stay Road and the environs. And, and a lot of what we have learned, we've learned from them. A lot of what we've learned about coping and resilience, we've learned from these communities. And um, taking control where we can take control is one of the messages. Life sometimes now particularly feels out of control. So let's think of what things we do control. What are we uh, able to be in charge of? If we think about all the things that we're not in control of, then that makes us very anxious. So we need to do the opposite. Think of the things that we can impact, what we can do, um, and then do them. My not young father in Los Angeles, who normally volunteers in the hospital there, was told to stay home. He's not a population that they want to have coming to the hospital. And I spoke to him yesterday. And also, I can't visit him. I don't know when the next time I'll be able to visit him is, which is a realization that hit me yesterday. Um, but he's very upset that they won't let him volunteer. He said, I'm old anyway. I've lived my life. I want to help. And I'm not being allowed to help. So he's dealing with anxiety about wanting to help and not being allowed to. So I think what you're saying is very true, that we need to find ways where we can help. And I think many of us have that instinct. What can I do if it's reading to my grandchildren through Zoom at bedtime just to give the parents 20 minutes off? Or if it's uploading something uh, or whatever it is or sharing sharing uh, a lesson plan. And there's a lot of people doing that now on the Internet. We have to make sure the electricity doesn't go out. If not, then we're all really in trouble because that's what we're also dependent on. But in being able to really think about not what can't I do, but what can I do? Because the can't I is a very long, long list. And that's just going to get us into a spiral of that kind of helplessness and frustration and anger and anxiety and not good things. And so maybe what we need to do, and Shabbat is coming in, at least here for us in Israel, by the time you hear this, it'll already be a new week with its with its opening um, wonders uh, is to really focus on possibly the shorter but more important list of the things that I can do. I think that's really a good way to uh, perhaps conclude our talk. So if I just summarize, we talked about having a schedule. Uh, we talked about grounding. We talked about finding physical outlets. Uh, we talked about using all of the ways we know to cope, what we've done in the past, what works. And... We talked about spirituality, and we talked about taking back as much control as we can. And all of these points are very important in terms of building resilience and keeping our good spirits and keeping uh, a feeling, a good feeling oh. in these difficult times. Dr. Naomi Baum, thank you so much for this interview. As she mentioned, you can find her Baum. Dot com and a lot of the things that she herself has lived through and definitely helped other people through may very well help you during 
We don't know for how long, but during these unusual times, but unusual times and stressful times are also times of opportunity and growth and change. And let's keep that in mind. Uh, Most of us know that. The times of the stress in our life turns out to have been times where we were able to make changes that perhaps we would have not had we not uh, been forced to to a certain degree. So thank you, everybody. Stay well. Eve Harrow and the Land of Israel Network. Thanks to Ben. And thanks to Tabitha. You can always write to me, eve at thelandofisrael.com. And I will, God willing, be back next week. Take care, everybody. And Chodesh Tov, whatever month they decide it's going to be, it should be a good one. Take care, everyone. Goodbye for now. Yishai Fleischer describes what it's like to live in quarantine. Take it very seriously. And let's stay healthy. And let's help other people stay healthy. Join him and his wife, Malka Fleischer, for a special coronavirus update and humor as well. A little bit of humor. Well, that's how Jews get by. Right. We got gel. We got alcohol gel in all up room, in our house. Every room. Click on The Yishai Fleischer Show on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. We're famous for our humor, right. us Jews.